ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I acknowledge the presence of my colleague uh, Aon O'Reardine and uh, Nessa Childers, any other public representatives present. Uh, I represent Tala, and uh, I live in Clondalkin. They split the constituency some time ago. So coming from living in Clondalkin and representing Tala, I didn't realize that she met in such plush circumstances in the north side. Uh, this is certainly the Rolls Royce of facilities. Uh, so I'm glad to see that, uh, that somebody came out on the right side of the crash. Thank you, Jack, and the organizers for the, for the invitation, and indeed to all of those who volunteer uh, to make and develop community media here uh, on this 30th anniversary of the inauguration of the Near Media Co-op. I read the bit in the Irish Times uh, during the week uh, where uh, the story reminded us of Near FM's what they call very humble beginnings with its first studio in an empty car crate wallpapered with egg boxes in a vacant school in Kulak. Well, much has been achieved uh, and much has changed uh, over the years and community radio in particular has established itself as an extremely beneficial resource uh, to this community. Given the degree of financial and economic trauma that we've seen, not just in Ireland, but across the world, uh, one would expect the media to have had a critical role to play in explaining and moderating events to people and ensuring that lived experiences are reported and in explaining the impact of such seismic changes on lives and communities globally and nationally. Whether and to what extent it has discharged that responsibility is obviously one of the issues uh, that will concern you in the debate today. The importance of media, the importance of its role of mediating information between citizens, whether as individuals or at the level of citizens organized into sectors, lobbies, interest groups, or even political parties, cannot be underestimated. It is natural to think that the media sector, in such tumultuous times as these, should be all the more concerned with engaging with the issues, with questioning and challenging assumptions, with affecting social and indeed political change. However, your brochure for this event, I note, says, and I quote, what's wrong with the media in Ireland? Why are social justice issues not covered adequately? I wish you a fair wind in ventilating your views, and I wish you better luck uh, than I experienced uh, when I voiced some timid criticisms of some practices in the media recently. But in fairness, the mainstream media organizations are struggling. The rise of social media and the advent of flexible and tailored internet-based advertising threaten the basic advertising income of all media, national and local, print and broadcast. These effects are compounded by the, the general economic situation. It has meant job losses, changing terms of employment, and it threatens the viability of previously venerable institutions. The reality is that our media system is mostly, and will continue mostly, to be commercially driven. Media products must sell themselves, and they have very short shelf lives, uh, so they need to be eye-catching. One result is that the commercially driven media can perhaps present a limited enough view of the world. With so much space allocated to soap opera, tragedy, drama, glamour, celebrity, there is not sufficient, uh, there is not sufficient room for in-depth analysis of the news or engagement with the stories that do not make the headlines, or, in the words of one commentator, there is no market out there for that kind of thing. The communications media remains, however, an integral part of our democracy. Without properly functioning media, democracy, or at least the modern democratic state, cannot function properly. It's as simple as that. This is because the proper functioning of 
our democratic system, depends ultimately on freedom of expression. We must remain mindful of the rightful liberty of expression in, enshrined in the Constitution and remain eternally vigilant to ensure that that guarantee is vindicated. Freedom of expression is often described by analogy with economics as if there was a marketplace of ideas, as if the function of the state was simply to leave the market to operate according to its own inevitable rules. We could all hope with John Stuart Mill and John Milton that in a free and open market, the truth will ultimately prevail. But for the marketplace of ideas to be free, it must first be freely accessible, one where anyone can put up a stall. The truth is that markets are not driven by inevitable and perfect laws. And because of its central importance, the marketplace of ideas has not been left to its own devices. The state intervenes in order to widen accessibility. It is, of course, difficult in principle and in practice to marry intervention with freedom. But to take two examples, both public service broadcasting and the community radio sector exist because of state regulation of an intervention in the marketplace. Meanwhile, all around us, the media business, globally and nationally, is changing dramatically. It is far too early to predict what the ultimate implications of these fundamental changes are, either on a general basis or for a small country like Ireland. Governments must continue to ensure a diverse, plural, and independent media and must remain open to new measures to that end. It is clear that the phenomenon where media ownership becomes concentrated in the hands of a small number of wealthy individuals may not be in the interests of the public. Regardless of how benignly some of our cheerleaders for the moguls have always portrayed them. Across Europe, concentration of ownership of newspapers and other news organizations has the potential to seriously harm the ability of media to report in an independent manner, both through editorial modulation and critically by undermining the reputation of organizations. Concentration of ownership and, uh, and concentration of control are valid concerns, and one that uh, governments must be prepared to engage with uh, and as and when it arises. And I count ourselves in that number. Like most member states, we have a system for evaluating media mergers and acquisitions, but it is one that is past due an overhaul. The law must properly reflect the importance that government attaches to diversity of ownership and content because of the impact the media have on the character of public discourse and indeed on the character of our democracy. Without public policy and state intervention, there would perhaps be a tremendous gulf between two different worlds. On the one hand, the world of radio in the community, for the community, about the community, and by the community, and on the other hand, a small number of enormous commercial media conglomerates that are operated solely for profit by the privileged and the powerful. The role of RTE and TG Car as public service broadcasters, is to help bridge that gulf. This is state intervention in what would otherwise be a commercial market, and it is done because we do not want our debate between ourselves and about ourselves to be hosted solely by commercial and market operators. The reservation of broadcasting spectrum and its allocation to community radio stations like your own is another public policy intervention by the state and for similar reasons. RTE and TG Car have public service mandates that are probably, in fairness, impossible to achieve. They must be all things to all men, to all women and children. They must, by law, for example, make programs that entertain, inform, and educate, provide coverage of sporting, religious, and cultural activities, cater for the expectations of the community generally, cater for those with 
special or minority interests. Be responsive to the interests and concerns of the whole community. Reflect cultural diversity. Have special regard for distinctively Irish cultural elements. Facilitate contemporary cultural expression and encourage innovation. They must do all of this while still holding on to viewers and listeners in sufficient numbers to make the audience attractive to advertisers. The result is of, uh, is of necessity, a mixed output. Much of what our public service broadcasters do would not be done at all if it was not funded by the TV license fee. I wonder whether those particular programs should not be identified and branded by the broadcasters as such. And I'm not discouraged by that output. I'm impressed, for example, that the Documentary on One series has collected over 50 international awards since 2008. I'm also impressed rather than disheartened by the fact that those documentaries can still attract tens of thousands of listeners. I fully accept and expect that governments must be challenged consistently. The full spectrum of views, interests and concerns in our increasingly diverse society must be represented in the great national debate hosted by the media. This is what media does, or at least is supposed to do, to inform, to investigate, and to analyze all that goes on around us. Community media has a vital role to play in this respect. It provides an alternative to the mainstream media and its concerns, offering an outlet for those whose views are not represented on commercial or even public service broadcasts. And the democratic nature of community media offers communities, grassroots movements, and individuals a particular opportunity to communicate their experience and viewpoints. My generation in particular would acknowledge the role the media played in Ireland in enabling women. First, to communicate their shared experience with each other, and then to organize for change. Women's liberation has been a project of the mass communications age. Community radio is now very prominent in Ireland, and a strong network of stations has developed since the services were licensed on a pilot basis in 1995. In 2003, Near FM became the first radio station in the country to podcast. Just another example of how fundamentally the communications media have changed in the last decade. Content is now liquid ephemeral. It can flow across borders, across devices, and across communities with almost uncanny ease. And there is so much of it. The volume brings its own challenges. To long-standing concerns about maintaining and preserving plurality and a role for serious journalism, we can now add a series of new concerns, such as there being too much content about local and national stories being drowned out, of local and regional cultural distinctions uh, being obliterated, uh, and around the fact that service providers and search engines can now exercise editorial control by choosing content on the basis of prior search histories. The arrival of social media in particular has devolved the power to create news to the individual citizen and the ensuing and rapid diversification of views online is symptomatic of this. This democratization of our public discourse seems, at least on the surface, to be a positive development. Social media increasingly has a crucial role in ensuring that those in authority are held to account, that actions are reported and interrogated, that inaction is queried, and that the established order of things is questioned. The ability to express one's opinion on anything has been massively democratized by affordable and pervasive technologies. The media as a whole is being remade before our eyes. We may not immediately appreciate the full import of what we're living through, but one of the central pillars of the Western democratic state is changing right in front of our eyes. The model whereby a relatively small number of media organizations sell their content retail and wholesale to a mass market is being challenged by a monumental paradigm shift. Maintaining, strengthening, 
and developing standards in media would, in the best of times, be a constant concern. But we are not in the best of times, far from it. Instead, like in so much else, we are considering these issues against the backdrop of almost overwhelming economic and technical challenges. Both government and industry are faced with a profound responsibility to ensure that standards in media are preserved in so far as that is possible. It falls to us to continue to engage on this subject in a constructive and open manner. In conclusion, Jack and uh, delegates, the Near Media Co-op is indeed a fine example of what can be achieved by a community organization with a clear idea of its purpose and role. Near cooperatives desire to develop the community sector while retaining its core values will be well served by today's program of speakers and discussion. And I wish the conference well. Thank you very much. Now, I get me get myself in order. Thank you very much.